Hello, my name is Rob Simpson and welcome to Directors Uncut. If this is your first episode, we put fellow makers from all corners of the globe onto a huge list that covers everything from Kings of Exploitation to the greatest of all times. Or the ghosts, if you're one of those people who insists on using that terrible phrase. <laughs> then... We turn into a lottery of directors, and by using a random number generator, we pick a name out of the hat, whatever name comes out. Myself and some guest hosts discuss them and their work through two films. This week, I've been joined by Graham of Pop Screen and Horrified and other stuff. Hello. Hello there. And Aiden, Aiden F, specifically, giving Uh, you a proper name. (laughs) Yeah, that's my real name. Long time co-conspirator, I guess Mm -hmm. we call you. Going yeah. back to uh, Cinema Eclectica and yes, excellent. How are you both? I'm good. I'm I'm minding a difficult cat, uh, which is you know it, it's time consuming, but it's rewarding. If we're talking about pets, I just got in from walking the dog, so ah, day, right. actually, really, 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 really lovely time. But is it a difficult dog, Lloyd? And... <laughs> he is actually, to be honest, he's a right little shit. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I, I love him, but he's, he's a little shit. Okay, okay. I don't know how I'm pulling back from that now, but <laughs> um, let's just ignore it completely and don't try and segue it out of it because that's that's how greater men than me have fallen. Um, Alexander McKendrick, he came out with um, on one of the most recent recordings. Who probably best known for Lady Killers? Um, so, as ever, I have to open this podcast with the question to both of you: Where did you first hear of him? Where did you first hear of Alexander McKendrick? I can't remember who said. I think it might have been Ben Wheatley who uh, recommended that McKendrick wrote one of the all-time great filmmaking books. Um, yeah. that uh, on, on, on filmmaking, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, and I think it was through him that I first heard about McKendrick. Like, say, through um, like talking about the Lady Killers and you know things like that. That is interesting because he basically said, "I've had enough of filmmaking," and went off and become a lecturer. I think at uh, American University. I can't remember which one. Mm. Yeah, California correct. was it? Yeah, yeah. So I hear from from his academic work before his filmmaking work. That's interesting. That. I think, yeah, it, it's a landmark book. And one day, I mean, the ultimate accolade is I even plan to get around to reading it. Um, but <laughs> but for me, it's hard for me to say when I first found out about Alexander McKendrick because so many of his films are just in the water in this country, aren't they? Like, when did you yeah. first hear mm. about the lady killers? Well, I I don't know. It feels like it could probably have been shortly after I was born, to be honest. Yes, mm. when you're when you're a young scrapper, you hear about Spider Man and the Lady Killers. It's what happens in this country. <laughs> you know, it just is. Oh man, that, yeah. that was a crossover too far for Marvel. I thought. <laughs> oh, and he's some pogs as well. <laughs> Showing the age there, probably. <laughs> God, I would love to see Spider Man No Way Home, but on Lady Killers cut. <laughs> 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 and, and that, that's confusion too far <laughs> but you are right though it's, it's just you, you don't really hear of him it's, it's the same that happened in the recent recording with uh, Hodorowsky where did you hear of Hodorowsky I don't know it just happened I just knew about him all of a sudden Yeah, and, uh, McK- was, McKendrick's exactly the same if there was one filmmaker who I thought had actually been inserted as a sort of global false memory Hodorowsky would be quite high up on the list. His movies are definitely Mandela effect shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, McKendrick, just, you just, I knew about the Lady Killers probably around the university age. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I would say the same with me. Yeah. Was it, I think it was either, it was definitely this Elon work that I heard of from beforehand, plus one of the films that we're talking about today, Sweet Smell, Sweet Smell of Success. I heard hmm. about it was like one of the definitive American movies of the like 50s, 60s. So, yeah, I, I would say around about the same same thing for me, really. Okay, that's interesting. Which one do you want to do first? We're doing to the uh, Sweet Smell of Success, 1957, I believe that was, mm-hmm. and uh, Man with the White Suit, 1951. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, which one do you want to tackle first? Hmm. Um. Just out of curiosity, had we all seen Sweet Smell of Success before? Yeah. I hadn't. I, had. I never had. Oh, right. Okay. Because I, I was the opposite because I hadn't seen The white, uh, the Man in the White Suit before. Oh, decisions. Um, just to be, I guess, 
just to think of the format, because normally we do like the lesser known film uh, first with the bigger one come after. And I guess just by a hairpin, Sweet Smell of Success is bigger. So do you want to talk that first? Can do, yeah. It makes kind just of switch sense it up a bit. because I think the man in the white suit is one that you can hold off till the end because the man in the white suit is very, it's kind of typical McKendrick and this really isn't, I think. Okay. Mm. So um, who wants to have a, a stab at synopsizing this later era? I guess it'd still be noir. I think it's not quite neo-noir. But yeah, this later era noir. I can do it if you want. Sure. Fire away. So it's about a press agent, Sidney Falco, played by Tony Curtis, who has been trying to curry favour with the clients that he has with J.J. Hunsicker, a very prominent gossip columnist uh, played by Burt Lancaster. And his problem is that Hunsicker is, has this strange obsessive relationship with his younger sister Susan and is trying to derail her romance with a jazz musician called Steve Dallas. And in order to prove his loyalty to Hunsicker and get the publicity for his clients that he wants, Falco then has to try and break up their relationship. It's the sort of thing that when you say it like that, you think you, you could make a rom-com out of this, really. I want that boy taken apart. JJ, why do something that's going to drive them right back into each other's arms? I know how to handle Susie. You just... You just handle the boy. Preferably tonight. What's tomorrow, a holiday? Your fat cop friend. I think I'm going home. Maybe I left my sense of humor in my other suit. You've got a God-given brain, Sidney. Use it. You think this is a personal thing with me? Are you telling me I think of this in terms of personal peak? Don't you see that today that boy wiped his feet on the choice and the predilections of 60 million men and women in the greatest country in the world? If you had any morals yourself, you'd understand the immorality of that boy's stand today. It wasn't me he criticized. It was my readers. Don't remove the gangplank, Sidney. You may want to get back on board. JJ, it's one thing to wear your dog collar. When it turns into a noose, I'd rather have my freedom. The man in jail is always for freedom. Except if you'll excuse me, J.J., I'm not in jail. You're in jail, Sidney. You're a prisoner of your own fears, your own greed and ambition. You're in jail. You're blind, Mr. Magoo. This is the crossroads for me. I won't get Kello. Not for a lifetime past to the polar ground. Not if you serve me Cleopatra on a plate. Sidney, I told you. J.J., I swear to you on my mother's life, I wouldn't do that. Not if you gave me a column would I do a thing... And who do you suppose writes the column while Susie and I are away for three months? The man on the moon? Thank you, Sydney. And Sydney, I'll have that piece of paper back. And also makes it sound uh, much more simple than it actually is. Yeah, Just... that's that's loosely sketching in the start, I think. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, the reading behind it, apparently uh, the critical reception behind this was not a good one. Well, I mean, the commercial reception, it was too talky and too static. And hmm. it's not. It's an incredibly fast-moving uh, movie, which has um, Tony Curtis zipping and zopping all over the place, uh, trying to chat with all sorts of people in... I don't know where it is. I'm assuming it's New York. It always feels like New York. This it, it, it is New York, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you bang on the money there. And it's a New York that I absolutely adore because it's... You know, not the typical New York where it's like dirty and scuzzy. There's a lot of like it's constantly full of like jazz clubs, yeah. like people just crammed in the setting. In setting, if you're talk, talking about in terms of setting, yeah. Um, but it, it's so fast paced and so quick moving that it goes through so many phases and so many different manipulations and backstory. It's it feels like it, I don't know if it's an adaptation of a book, but it feels like an adaptation of the book where they just took one chunk and left all the other bits missing 
but it's still got the sort of remnants of those bits around the book. Uh, around the adaptation, I should say. Do you see what I mean? Mm. It's adapted from, and I quote, a novelette in Cosmopolitan. And if your next question is, <laughs> what is a novelette? Uh, the answer is, I don't have a clue. Uh, but it, it does have an incredible pair of co-writers. The source author and co-screenwriter is Ernest Lehman, who I know best for his script for Hitchcock's North by Northwest. Uh, the adaptation of it was also handled by Clifford Odette, the legendary left-wing playwright of the Depression era, and inspiration for Barton Fink. Oh, okay. There's well, a bomb. Uh, I guess just looping back around, uh, I think immediately I have to ask, what did you two think of this? I love it. Mm. And you've I think seen it's the it short before, answer. did you say? Yeah, I had. And I think the the thing is with Sweet Smell of Success is because it is, I find it such, you know, it's simple on the surface, obviously delving into this relationship between uh, Sidney Falco and J.J. Hudsucker. Mm. I've got the names right, haven't I? Yeah. yeah. Hudsucker. Yeah. Hudsucker, sorry. And um, even then, I find it a completely dense film to get, you know, to get into the rhythm of, because as Rob was saying, it is an incessantly chatty film. You yeah. know, there's constantly reams of dialogue within it. So I'm glad that you brought up like the novel aspect to it because it does feel like a cinematic hardbound novel in that way. But it's also one that's seeded in noir that, you know, it tackles in like different relationships and character power plays and character dynamics of like, say, this person trying to get, you know, Hunsucker down a peg, basically, and mm-hmm. trying to exploit that relationship between him and I, I believe it's his sister or something yeah, like that. Younger sister, yeah. Yeah. So it works for me that way, but at the same time, you know, it is such a dense film, obviously just being walloped in the face with dialogue that, honestly, I don't quite get, but at the same time, I just love just, you know, Burt Lancaster and Tony Curtis at each other's throats for it. I mean, mm, Graham? Uh, yeah, I, I, my first thing I was going to say is that I think the fast-talking journalist movie is something that absolutely should make a comeback. I suppose I could just watch something like Spotlight on one and a half times the speed, but it's not the same thing. Uh, I think in terms no, of the, no, no. <laughs> in terms of the film's generic identity, it is right at the tail end of the classic noir era. But it, it while it has a noirish vibe. I think because it's not strictly a crime story, I don't feel like I have to be in a, the right mood for it, which I often can with classic noir. I love it, but I have to be in the right frame of mind. Whereas this is so accessible and it feels like, sadly, it's never not going to be relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure personally. I mean, the first time I watched it, I, I loved it. But mm. it's so nihilistic. Yeah. And so hopeless its view of the world really i mean one dialogue is uh, going into spoilers here i'm very sorry but it's a what 60 plus year old movie 70 plus year old movie um mm. what is the line uh, i'd sooner commit suicide than live in a world with you it's yes yeah. savage biting dialogue so while i respect the hell out of it it's a fantastically well made and venomous movie I don't know whether I like it because I don't think it really wants you to like it. I think it the movie wants you to find it sort of confrontational and and a bit of a bully, really. It's a bully mm. boy of a movie, this to use uh, a yeah. phrase from the time. Yeah, no, I, I would say that, and a bit of it comes from like uh, both Tony Curtis and Rick, Burt Lancaster. I'm, I, I absolutely love you know Burt Lancaster for being like such a prime star, of, like you know American talent of the mm. era. Um, and there's a, one line, one of my favorite lines is um, when we first meet him and he goes to obviously talking around execs in a nightclub and um, one of them just confronts like JJ Hunsecker and says to him, um, you know, why does everything you say sound like a threat? And then my and it's my favorite line of dialogue because um, he just retorts and say, well, maybe it's just mannerism because I don't threaten friends. There's just something mm. about it that's just so subtle that I appreciate with the, how the dialogue's written as well. And I think that's my sticking point. Yeah, okay. I think so. Curtis is fantastic in this movie. I'd not really had much time for him before because I tended to see him in movies where he's overshadowed by the rest of the cast. 
you know, I think um, he, he's not the best thing in some like it horse. He's certainly not the best thing in Spartacus, but he is really creepy and insinuating here, and you can s- you can almost see his soul kind of ebbing away as the film goes on. He's not an idealist at the start of the film by any means, but being drawn into Hunsecker's orbit puts him in the orbit of an absolute monster who he's not equipped to cope with. Hmm. Yeah, and it is a, a bold performance by both of them, really. Mm. Another bit of the background behind it, it wasn't well received because everybody was hoping that it'd be a Tony Curtis movie where he played a, ni- a young, a nice young boy, you know. <laughs> the, the and he's not, can, yeah. He's not, he's a, he's he's, a, he's he's a, sh- he's a shithouse, honestly. <laughs> um, he's basically uh, Huntsecker's wild dog who goes after these leads and does all the manipulation and plants evidence and does... There's not a good thing about him really I mean, he kind yeah. of catches a conscience kind of mm. but still it's a horrible role and I don't think that was really a thing at the time I mean yes you and Noir were popular but still the film industry back then was not quite as broad a church as it is now yeah yeah you don't cast yeah to go against type then was really a big deal not like it yeah. is now where it's just it's sort of par for longevity in your career. Then you were kind of like rallying against the system, basically. <laughs> yeah. Same for uh, Bert Lancaster, too. He's nasty in a very much more matter-of-fact way, I think. Lancaster's a great actor, and I always really admire the fact that once he noticed that his star was slipping, he went to work with Visconti and Bill Forsyth and loads of really interesting international directors. I think yeah. possibly, while I'm certainly not dismissing you know, the fact that people did not want to see cute little Tony Curtis play such a twat. Um, (laughs) I think there is a part of this film's negative reception which can be ascribed to one of the old rules of Hollywood going back as far as Citizen Kane, which is that you don't mess with the people who might be reviewing your film. You know, Hunsecker is a pretty loathsome portrait of the power of the press and if you, I mean, Aiden, we did the Oscar recently for Pop Screen, mm, uh, yeah. and that has that absolutely insane moment in retrospect where Hedda Hopper comes on, and Hedda Hopper was like a, a character very similar to J.J. Hunsaker, a really nasty, bitter gossip columnist who included a lot of right wing anti communist politics in her gossip. Uh, but because the Oscar mm. is such a toothless and stupid film, she comes on and everyone's like, oh, it's Hedda Hopper! Hooray! And it's like, no, you should be <laughs> pelting her with cans of food. Uh, I, I think this is, <laughs> this is obviously a more honest portrait by f- when you look back at how much power a gossip columnist held at that point and how thinly veiled their political agendas were. I am not surprised that this was not well received at the time. Just, mm. just, just thinking there, there is actually quite a little uh, scene of movies like this. Mm. Um, I don't know yeah. if the dates sort of like match up particularly well, but uh, Billy Wilder's Ace in the Hall wasn't a million miles away from when this was put out, uh, mm. and that's the depiction of Kurt G- Douglas as a uh, journalist, and that is savage, really mm. savage. It does not you know, um, sugarcoat him. And also one which I don't think is as well known, but I can't remember who was in it, but uh, The Big Clock. Oh, oh here yeah, we go. Yeah. Forgetting oh, the names. Oh, yeah. I What's his name it. again? Oh, was that no. Charles Lawton? Charles Lawton, yeah. Charles Lawton is sort of the newspaper magnet. It doesn't exactly cover him in glory. So, mm. weird time. Weird time for movies then, sort of mid-50s. Sort yeah. Of late, late noir cycle. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it makes a lot of sense, really, because TV hadn't yet supplanted newspapers as the main way to disseminate news. So, if you're talking about media power and propaganda power, it's got to be about the papers. Like I say, the only problem with this approach is that the papers are more likely to review your film than the TV shows. So. It, mm. it's it's a calculated risk i guess you could say yeah um did this this fell in in the hairs cord didn't it just the hairs cord yeah. It, yeah was it just after the hairs cord or no no roundabout 
Yeah, okay. the Hays Code started to fade away in the early 60s. Yeah, because this... I feel it maybe have done a disservice by it being under the Hays Code, really, because I think there's a much more bitter and cynical ending in mind for this movie than, than what we get, really. Um, I'm not a fan of the ending. Oh, I really mm, like the ending, if only for that line of dialogue you quoted, which is, as you rightly noted, even nastier than an actual death would have been. Yeah, oh, yeah it's very, yeah. very biting. Your own flesh and blood to say that to you. Mm. That's especially when how that's portrayed. Because um, you know, Tony Curtis, Sidney Falco actually goes up to the the apartment block, and um, you know, and even with what Graham says, how uh, his sister, the Burt Lancaster's you know, fictional sisters, like, tries to dart off the edge and um, obviously try and commit suicide mm. uh, from this whole, you know, situation, really. I think even there, it's just, it's basically like the, you know, dark circle has just come fully formed, really, of this film. It's such a complex, a morally complex movie as well, um, because he's effectively, uh, Tony Curtis is effectively only doing as he's told. Yeah. Mm. But the consequences are brutal for his character. It's I don't think it's it's really taking a stance. It's just uh, there was a movie that I watched. I watched uh, completely unrelated for this a few years back, a Hong Kong action movie, which is a bit of a leap, I admit. <laughs> I think it's called yeah. right. It's called uh, Writing Wrongs. I can't remember who directed it, but uh, mm-hmm. effectively, it suggests that the only way to right wrongs is everybody's too far gone. Just kill them all. <laughs> effectively. <laughs> Oh, wow, I think this movie has sort of a similar st- um, sort of blanket statement, really, which isn't the most nuanced of stances. I mean, it's okay for a Hong Kong action movie, but for something which is as biting a satire as this, I'm not sure. I think it really works, and I think it helps that I know enough about the yellow press around that time to think that, yeah, Lancaster's character is probably every bit as much of a demon as he, he uh, was portrayed in this film, and I'm glad they managed to get this film out when people like Hedda Hopper and Walter Winchell could still be like could still actually watch it and have their feelings hurt. I think that's quite gratifying. Hmm. Mm. You did mention it earlier how it is effectively ageless. In fact, it's probably. I know the stereotype or the, the cliche is age like a fine wine, but I don't think that's actually fitting enough because yeah, this is one of those very rare movies that have got more relevant the older it's got, not just better. It's it's better and more relevant. Yeah. I don't well, know many movies that have really done that. It's funny that, yeah, looking at the that era of like American cinema, because there's also, um, what was the Yelia Kazan film with... Um, it was put on Criterion like a few years back now. Oh, a face Fa- in the crowd. Uh, yeah. Um, and I've been dying to see that film, but I know how massively ahead of its time it is, but in that I've heard like very similar cynical portrayals of how that is comparison of like a film for like the Donald Trump era of American mm-hmm. politics. Absolutely. I think the big difference between this and a face in the crowd is that the the monster in the face in the crowd is Andy Griffith at the height of his charm. (laughs) And you get a certain sense of how this guy can suck people in and make people ignore the things that are shady and corrupt about him. Whereas Hunsek is just kind of a monster from the start and he never fades away. And I think with a less good script or with an actor who was less capable than Lancaster, that would risk looking very hammy in one note. But I think this pulls it off. Yeah, yeah, I do I do like it. I mean, I have reservations about it, but I think it, it's sort of natural reservations of any movie which is this cynical. Yeah. Like I, I think said at the thing... beginning, and I don't think it particularly wants to be liked. It's just so yeah. mean-spirited, I guess. No, I can absolutely go with that. I think the thing with McKendrick is a lot of his best films are cynical. Not all of his films are cynical, but the best ones are. But in the British films, which we'll get to, there is a sliver of affection for the country and the sort of archetypal characters that you would have in a British comedy. Whereas transplanting him to America, 
there is affection for some things in there. Like like Aiden touched on earlier, I think the jazz scene is portrayed quite warmly, but it is definitely a much, much darker film than anything he'd in Britain. Mm. It, it's the scene that he uh, has affection for, New York and the club scene and the jazz singers and, yeah. and that sort of uh, that vibe of the time. I think he has a great deal of affection for, but everything else is going back to that Hong Kong movie. It's just burn it all down. It's all corrupt. Mm. Not saving anybody here. I suppose maybe the reason why we're having slightly divergent reactions is that I think burn it down, it's all corrupt, there's nothing to save here is also basically how I feel about the British press. So it it doesn't seem (laughs) particularly (laughs) cynical to me. I'm just sat there thinking, God, yeah, yeah, I I really wish someone would make this about the fucking Observer's opinion section. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, I I completely agree about the British press, by the way. It's just like, Mm. I much hate the Daily Mail as much as I don't like, the, you know, the Guardian or the Independent. Yeah the, yeah. the British press, the British political system, keep on going. It's just so many things you could uh, lay that yes. the doorstep off. Yeah. Um, so uh, any closing thoughts? Anything you want to bring up before we pick what's up next? I love some of the sort of slang and quips in this there's a particular one where i mean everyone talks in a very stylized way because it's it's noir adjacent and noir always has very stylized dialogue Mm. and i love that but there's a wonderful piece of what i assume is actual or meant to be actual jazz slang in it where uh someone says supsy that's fish four weeks old i won't buy it I just, that's a great metaphor. How is fish four weeks old the first thing that comes to your head in that situation? Mm. I think my final po- uh, point of call that Elmar that Elmar Bernstein's go. <sighs> yeah, beautiful. And, mm, I think it's terrific. What else did he do actually? Because he was like a pretty prominent name for Oh to Kill a Mockingbird, Grand Escape. Ghostbusters trading places. Yeah, I've just looked at Bazaar DB now and I'm just <laughs> noting it all down. <laughs> quote. I'm just looking for quotes because there was one which was particularly uh, good, I think. Um, was it the cats in the bag and the bags in the river? That was the one that. Uh, oh, no, there it is. It's from Huntsecker. It says, uh, You're dead, son. Go get yourself buried. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a fun. It's, just, it's a, kind of iconic, really. A lot of the. Uh, the language in it it's every single one it's like my right hand hasn't seen my left hand in 30 years it's <laughs> who says that it's just the the dialogue is beautiful from this era of cinema i think you know yeah. he talks like it but it's you can see where its literary roots are definitely with this yeah. this dialogue and i think it does that perfect thing i mean i can't remember what it was called but there's a certain noir where you can very heavily feel the literary roots uh, because the script, I can't remember what it's called, Graham might remember, but it, it, the narration describes everything. It's like she's a woman of 30, but she looks like she's had a hard life, so she's got the face of a 40-year-old woman. And mm. it's it's from that kind of hard-boiled fiction school, isn't it? Yeah. It's just just yeah. shut up and let a scene breathe. But I think a movie like this has a perfect balance of it. It has that sort of, sort of rippling dialogue, but it doesn't yeah. feel the need to have it every single minute second of the thing <laughs> was it's the perfect spot yeah. for it was it that Edgar G. Ulmer film you were thinking about Rob it's um, funny how he knew straight away wasn't it yeah, yeah. It <laughs> he, he, he hate it so much uh, I apologise it's just me um, no uh, I've forgotten the name of the film as well to be honest uh, I love d yeah. well, there we go <laughs> a movie that just needs to shut up for five minutes if ever there was one <laughs> I drove once, remember? <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Maybe it's not us. It's not us. It's not us. It's us. It's us. He wants us. He wants us. All right, all right. We're pulling over. We're pulling over. All right, fellas. All right. Just, just, just act normal, all right? Act normal. Not normal for us, normal like for regular people. Good day. Hi. May I see your license and registration, please? <laughs> there you go. 
Thank you. Oh, Americans. Welcome to Ontario. Sportsman's paradise. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Would you please get out and step away from the vehicle? Okay. What is wrong with this picture? Um... Uh... No snow tires. No. I was, uh... Driving on the wrong side of the road. I can explain that. You see, I'm not used to your rules up here, and I was... That's not it. This writing on the side of your vehicle. Oh! How did that get there? Those kids at, at the garage, I just stopped for, like... Whatever. My concern is the sensibilities of a certain distinct and viable part of Canadian society. Les Québécois. Huh? You know, the wine drinkers. Pea soup eaters. French Canadians. Oh, oh, yeah, those guys, sure. If you wish to avoid prosecution, I would advise that you comply with our language laws, which specifically prescribe that all signs be in both English and French, Canada's two official languages. Okay. I do have to fine you. That'll be $1,000 Canadian or 10 American dollars, if you'd prefer. Oh, no, no, I'll pay, uh, pay the American there, yeah. There you go, buddy. What do you want, 10? Thank you very much. There's your receipt. Thank you. And now? In French, if you please. Jumping in for the final time this season, um, just to say, basically, thank you for listening. If you have enjoyed it, you know what to do. Subscribe wherever you're listening to this. Um, if you happen to be listening to this on either Spotify or... Apple Podcast, please give us a rating and a review because it will help the show remain visible and when it's going on a season break after this episode, that visibility is super, super important. It's also the best thing you can do to help out this podcast. Um, but if you want to keep up with what's happening in the interim between this season ending and the next one starting, please do check out my social media at... Um, underscore rj simpson on twitter or at directors uncut pod on instagram um if you have any emails you want to send me whatever there might be whatever nature there might be even well no not if you're a nigerian prince trying to access his millions please don't email me if you're that but otherwise please do email me at directors uncut pod at gmail.com um and i think that's about it really um, I do mention at the back end of the show the return of Listomania. Um, I'm also filling in a gap on Patreon by doing some reviews of Asian movies, Hong Kong, um, Japan and Korea. Movies that have either gone out of print or haven't been released in the UK. So, so if you want to contribute to the show of a few pounds here or there, you will get them as well as um, early access to those Listomania videos that I, I'll mention later on in the show. But yeah, I think that's about it. I think we're covered for season one. So, we'll be taking a month off, coming back first Friday of August. But the question remains, it's directors uncut. It's a random selection. Who's the next director? Well, this next clip will explain all of that. And when it's finished, we will come back and... T well, we'll do a second movie. Also, before I hand over to the previous clip... And the audio on the back end of the show is sketchy because, again, the software has decided that it'll much rather use the webcam than my microphone. So apologies for that. I'm just flagging it up ahead of time. So who's next? Let's find out. Um, so segueing out of that as, <laughs> as quickly as possible, uh, picking the next director for the next episode. Um, so... There is a list of 300, 463 directors. Um, I'm picking the next one is number 298, who is Michael Miller. Wow, okay. Oh. Didn't really expect that. Um, yeah, documentarian. I think it's our first documentarian. It's done a lot of politically charged uh, movies, but I don't know if I've seen many of his films, really. I think I've only seen Fahrenheit 9-11 and um, Bowling for Columbine. Me too. Oh, I saw the... But, but oh, go Cap on. there's one, is it Capitalism, A Love Story? Or I can't... I, they're, they're, some of them run yeah, into each other, right. actually, because I think they're, they're 
I think they've gotten kind of more and more sort of loose, haven't they really? More sort of scattershot really. So I, I can't remember exactly which one I saw, but it was one maybe from around the time of the the financial crisis, so probably from about 2008 or nine. I think I think it's Capitalism, a Love Story, which I didn't didn't impress me as much as the other two that I'd seen. But I remember him from the TV days. Um, it was something nation, Michael Moore's something nation. Mm, what was um, it I know the one you mean. Yeah, I've forgotten now. <laughs> that was another. Would it have been even it, it'd be an interesting atmosphere. Oh, it's just one. called TV yeah. Nation. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I it remember. Be... I watched that. That was uh, on um... two back in the nineties, mm. I guess. He's one of the class of documentarians who basically, well, most not documentarians are just directors that don't actually engage and be a presence on camera. There's a handful that do, and he, he's certainly one of them. I don't think he's one of the more enigmatic ones, um, <laughs> but yeah, he's an interesting character. Yeah, mm. He turns up in Team America World Police as well. Mm. Because there's the uh, you got to process that episode on two levels. There's the character that Michael Moore is, and then there's the documentarian, and there's mm. a there's a shift there. There's a schism there. Well, it'd be interesting to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Well, TV Nation was Louis Theroux's sort of uh, breakthrough as well, wasn't it? Mm. Surprised that he's not more of a director, honestly. But uh, no, he's only done that Scientology thing as a film, isn't he? I think. Yeah. Which is interesting, my my Scientology movie. I think it was Ooh, called. Yeah. Have a nail That's on good. the head there. <laughs> yeah. The My Favourite Film Podcast with me, Gav Smith. And me, Gary Coleman. Each episode, we talk to someone about their favourite film. And as it's someone's favourite film, that must make it a recommendation, right? That's right. We're like a book club for films. If you don't know what to watch, have a look through a list and see if there's something there. There's something there for every occasion. And I, in particular, like episode 20, that guy talking about when Harry met Sally, I thought it was brilliant. I think he was. Can't remember his name. Gary something. Gary no, something. I can't sure. remember now. So join us on the My Favourite Film podcast. It's available on all podcast platforms. Or you can pop along to the website, www.myfavouritefilm.com, where you can find all the links you could ever need. From us, till then, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen. We are privileged to witness one of our foremost scientists at work. However, to assure the complete success of this most intricate experiment, he must have absolute quiet. I repeat, absolute quiet. It shouldn't have done that. Who'd be a scientist? But if at first you don't succeed, try... Try... Try again. Mr. Huskins, it's worked. I've done it. I've got to see Mr. Burnley. I've done it. I've done it. Stop him. Stop him. Stop him. Sister, what's the trouble? He's mad. That's the trouble. <laughs> I know what they offer you. You could live the rest of your life on it. Go anywhere, do as you please. And if you want to be, I come too. Alec Guinness, the screen's most versatile star, triumphantly augments his gallery of brilliant film portraits as the man in the white suit. Hello. Hello. He saw his great discovery as a force for good. It's more important than anything. It's going to astound the world. They saw in it a danger to his fellow men and branded it a threat to industry. We need control of this discovery. Complete control. If you want twice the amount in that contract, we will pay it. A quarter of a million? To suppress it. Yes. You're an irresponsible young idiot. Father, no. Nutson. And you're a pompous and ungrateful old ass. Oh. Sidney. Nutson. No, Father. Nutson. If you think I'd give my invention to you, you must be crazy. I wouldn't give it to you if you were the last man on earth. I wouldn't give it to you if you went down on your bended knees and begged me for it. I won't stay in your house another minute. Okay. So, we've done Sweet Smell of Success. Let's jump into Man with the White Suit. 1951. I think it's his second film following Whiskey Galore. 
You may so, well yes. be right there. Let me check. Yes, yeah. This is a much more interesting, well, which more complicated film to pin down, really, um, because it's described as um, sci-fi, which I think is not entirely accurate. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. an Ealing movie, so obviously it stars Alec Guinness. I mean, come yeah. on. Yes. Yeah, he has to be there somewhere. Alec Guinness and a um, supporting appearance for Miles Mallison. It's ticking all the Ealing boxes. And uh, John Greenwood's in there too, who uh, pops up in his, his other movie, uh, Lady Killer. No, no, it was Kind Heart she was in, wasn't it? Yeah. I, yeah. I got... If- if we're talking about actors who we got giddy in, who we weren't expecting, <laughs> uh, Ernest Thesiger is uh, on my bucket list. Oh, I've got <laughs> okay. pages to say about Ernest Thesiger, but yes, let's let's hold that back for a bit. But yes, Alec Guinness is a scientist. He's creating this mad concept of a material that doesn't decay, doesn't, well, all things are repelled from it, uh, dirt, whatever, and... It's about his scientific process of learning how to do this and also the corporate back, well, corporate reaction to it, really, of a bunch of hundred year old men who want to benefit from it and make their millions off the back of it, really. Um, and it does, it's a bit of a tragedy in the end of the tale, really, but that's, that's the mm. setup. Yeah, Again, it does have a bit of a sting uh, the, in the ending. Yeah, yeah a film that uh, is not as irrelevant to modern times as its antiquity would make you think. He has a good track record of making films that feel kind of timeless. Hmm. So what were the feelings on this one, besides its timeless nature? Well, Aidan, you said this was the first time you saw it, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah, think... And I, yeah. No, I, I was just going to say I enjoyed this uh, quite a deal, but you know, it's like an Ealing film, so I, I wouldn't expect any better. You know, it, yeah. it's like I, I love Ealing so much. Hmm. It's Graham. it's one of my favourite Ealing, second only to uh, McKendrick's other sort of big hitter for Ealing, The Lady Killers, which is my absolute favourite Ealing film. I think well, that's not an answer expected. Yeah. Oh yeah. really? Oh okay. Yeah. No, I um, it it is quite atypical Ealing. I think it's very funny, although it's not straightforwardly a comedy i think that description of science fiction is not a million miles away from the truth it's just it's a type of science fiction that doesn't really exist in the movie sphere now where rather than talking about you know alien invasions or wars in space it's like what if suddenly tomorrow something was invented that changes the social order how would the world react to that? I think you can see it a bit in films like Ex Machina or some of those like yeah. mm. more recent films about AI. But this is... And also, this is, what if there was a, an experiment that went whoop, 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 whoop? Yeah. And it's uh-huh. adorable. I, yes. I, I know I won that. Chemi- that chemistry set is adorable, let's be honest. <laughs> Which is the thing, uh, of all the things you say, it's all, all correct, but that is the one thing which dates it most. The yeah, whoop whoop, like, the adorable whoop whoop machine. But it's hypnotic. I, I genuinely yes. felt like I was falling into a trance just listening to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing, because it, it has like such a, I wouldn't necessarily say musical quality to the whoop whooping. We're getting into the real technicalities here, lads. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, yeah, it's just, I could talk for days about that chemistry set, because it is just so great. Mm. I love it. It's a character in of itself. And it's also a satire as well. Not quite yeah. as as barbed a satire as Sweet Smell of Success, but come on, that's up there with your networks as far as the, the viciousness of that one. Completely. Mm. And this one, is it, it's just how vampiric, I think, the people are that are around him. Everybody mm. gets a sniff of blood in the water, or money in the water, yeah. however you want to phrase it. And the way the world just sort of engulfs him, really, it's and how quickly... The ending sort of changes his fate too. It's yeah, yeah. It's uh, because I remember there's a scene like towards like before like uh, Sidney Stratton, Alec Guinness's character, goes to meet like um, the execs headed by Ernest Thesiger, and um, he stops by and chats to uh, like pedestrians out on the street, and the str- and they just go, oh yeah, but you you know your invention, you know a white suit that doesn't stain or anything like that, it'll just be forgotten just as much as like say like the car with no battery 
or the electric car, things like that, and lists all these different inventions that, you know, mankind has, you know, adopted very quickly, but will soon be like, you know, left in the dust, really. Who will do does have my bit of us. laundry when there's no more laundry to do? Yeah. It's the framing of it as well. It says, John Greenwood, I think, says at one point, think of all the people who don't have to clean anymore who are struggling with sluggishness. Thought, yes. Wow. This, this is very much written from people shooting down, isn't it? <laughs> as a movie. But that was true of a lot of ealing, honestly. It was uh, oh. written by upper middle class look. I'm, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna quibble with that. I think for all Joan Greenwood turns out to be a more likable character, I think that's part of the film's satirical point that something has hmm. been invented where if it works, it's going to change human history forever, and that is hmm. the good thing about it. But the the, yes. the objection that people keep coming to Sydney with is that'll change human society forever. They can't be bothered to change. They don't want to have to reorder society. They think that, you know, if if things are difficult, if things are a pain, if things are inefficient, that's just the way things are. And I think it's a very barbed portrait of how even at in the immediate post-war years where you've got the NHS being set up, you've got British Rail being set up, you've got all these massive changes to British society, there's still a part of the British character that thinks, oh, change? What if it's different? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Never thought of it like that, but you are exactly right. And I think on that basis, it is probably just as as vicious as a sweet smell of success, honestly. It's just not packaged in a similar way. Where it's packaged as a as a light and frothy, fun ealing movie with Alec Guinness being a, a goofy, lovable scamp. Yeah, which yeah, yeah. Is I think that's part of the point. I mean, because it does have like I'm, I wouldn't necessarily call it like a silly edge to it, but there is like a constant, you know, funny feeling with it. I mean, I did get a lot of joy out of um, Alec Guinness's failed attempts to get the, the serum right. Yes, where it's just constantly where the execs just bellow at each other. Radioactive forum. What does he want that for? And then <laughs> closely followed by an explosion, like ten meters in the distance. <laughs> oh, I don't mean it. I don't mean it. Dis- d- demean it. It's just very light and frothy, like a lot of nineteen fifties movies were. But it was very light and frothy with oh. a, an edge behind it, which oh, yeah. is probably yeah. the point. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. England's genius. I think they are able to smuggle a few razor blades under the surface of something that appears superficially very cosy and light. It's a quality of, of balancing the dark and light that I would argue is genuinely Shakespearean. You know, I think they are as good at oh, wow. doing that mm. as Shakespeare was in something like As You Like It or Twelfth Night. And that's yeah. coming from a Shakespeare as fan as well. It's not a... absolutely, yeah. Uh, it, it wouldn't carry as much weight if I fucking hated the guy. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like this a great deal. Um, but to say it's your second favorite ailing, that is that's kind of blowing my mind a little bit. I'll be honest. That, mm. There's a, there's a few that chase it. You know, I when we watched Kind Hearts and Covenants again for the first episode of this show. I, I liked that a lot more than I remembered, and I think the Lavender Hill mob's delightful. But yeah, there's oh, just yes. something. There's just something about this. I don't know. I think it's it's earned its place. I think my personal favourite is, um, and it's not even like you know what Ealing are known for. It's uh, Dead of Night, the oh, horror anthology yeah. that they did. I've not seen that one yet. There's some great segments in there. I have a massive fondness for like Robert Hamer's take on the haunted mirror. And mm. Alberto Cavacanti's ventriloquist segments are equally stellar as well. But it just uh, sinks in yeah. to you. Yeah, that one. I'm just a big idiot. I like the Lavender Hill mob because it's a big, frothy movie. And I like it. It's got Sid James <laughs> in it. And not playing a, a pervert for once. <laughs> 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 Which is always, yeah. always nice. But this is an interesting movie, really. It's more interesting than, I think... Um, on the face of it, it plays out like any number of ailing movies. I mean, they did wow movies all over the genre. People just uh, brought them down to sort of a uh, dark comedy set in London in the fifties. Mm. There were much, much more of that. They did like Scott of the Antarctic. They did all sorts of things. Mm. But this is sort of the archetype, really, isn't it? I think and so. It, yeah, it 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 can be 
completely different to what you expect an ailing movie to be. It's fundamentally sci-fi. It's incredibly, incredibly political when you boil it down to it. It's quite the shrewd little thing. It's basically like a spy of a movie. Just It's got all this thing, but it just looks like a jolly old guy next door. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's very easy to remember Ealing nostalgically and, and correct to remember Ealing nostalgically. It's fine to look back on them warmly, but it's always worth remembering that Sir Michael Balkan, who ran the studio during its golden years, always said, you know, we make films about what is happening today. We do not do period dramas, which you know, in the context of the British industry, which does rather a lot of period dramas, particularly today, that's a big Mm -hmm. statement. And it reminds you that Ealing were always going for something a bit more than just making people laugh and sending them out to the cinema happy. There is an intention there to tell the story of their times. As as, uh, Rob mentioned earlier, the tragedy of the ending in The Man in the White 2 as well. Uh, is mm-hmm. a definitive example of that, really, because it, it, you know, it does have a message behind it, and you know, especially you know, considering how like the public just absolutely, you know, and I am going to spoil this because you know, it's like uh, it, it's an all enough it, fellow. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You've had like over sixty years to watch the Man in the White suit. Um, <laughs> pick one, um, but no way. They just tear the suit to shreds, basically, mm-hmm. and it is just like there is like his baby just completely just taken it aside really and just stomped on it's just mm. tragic really okay so um any final thoughts on man in the, with the white suit before we talk about mckendrick as a whole really well i think we, we've promised a bit of talk about ernest thessinger and i, I think we have to okay. go into his appearance here because he's incredible mm. i think anything with ernest thessinger is, is just guaranteed to be you know like a stamp of approval of quality, really, because he's just one of those all-time like English actors who, I guess, like the more comparable. You know, if if we're talking about modern standards, is like say an Ian McKellen mm-hmm. or sorry, mm-hmm. someone like that. Like, it was, but he was that's how we, I, I would see him as. He was like the Ian McKellen of his day, because um, you know he was in this. He was in um, the Bride of Frankenstein. Yes, uh, a lot of James Whale stuff actually. The more I think about it, and there's just some great. You know, there's just some great, mean, like old bulldog quality to him that you can't help but love. He was very, he was very waspish, wasn't he? That would be the word you'd have to use. I'm glad you mentioned Bride of Frankenstein because, for all, Thessinger had a great, long, varied career. His performance as Doctor Polidori in Bride of Frankenstein is just extraordinary, and it's the one where you think. No one else could have done that. That's pure Ernest Thessinger. And in this, he is too. I mean, he he adds a bit of that gothic quality to it. His character is this very elderly industrialist who looks like a sort of giant beetle in this huge cavernous like cloak. Yeah. It's it's He's terrific, um, and I'll, I'll yeah it, it, yeah I love the dude. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, Bride of Frankenstein is probably my favourite Universal monster movie. Defo, yeah. Okay. I'd also so, like to just okay. throw out a bit of praise quickly before we wind up for another of the supporting cast, Vida Hope, who plays Bertha, the shop steward, uh, who when Alec Guinness asks what they're all sort of going away from their work for, she just backs, tea break, we had to fight for it. <laughs> <She's so laughs> Mike, don't forget Michael Gore as well. Uh, oh, You've got to love a bit yeah. of Michael Gore. This is completely over my head, I'll have to admit. <laughs> it's, yeah, this is us at this our is sort not, of my gatissiest as we just sort of moon over elderly British character actors. <laughs> yes. this, this is not my era. This is not my era. I could do the same with Hong Kong actors of the 1970s, but this is not my, this is not my fight. <laughs> okay. So, um, yes. What do we think of Alexander McKendrick off these two? Or if you've seen more, you know, encompass them into your, your thoughts, really. But McKendrick, feelings. Hmm. Because I, I, I mean, I like his, you know, from the two films that I've seen of his, and, you know, these are the only two films that I've seen, um, I like him a lot. It's just kind of a shame that he didn't really have much, you know, of a backbone of a career, really, I felt. Um, he kind of became a bit tired of the industry so yeah he retired and became a lecturer so when somebody does that it ha- they have my respect honestly because mm. yeah 
they just become tired of the industry, so they take the ball home. It doesn't happen often how directors have that sort of uh, moral integrity, I guess. I guess, yeah. Um, because, uh, Grim, you had seen like a few more McKendrick films, haven't you? Yeah, a few more. Of, um, I've seen, obviously, The Lady Killers. Uh, as I said, I saw his film Mandy, a, a sort of quite quiet, low-key drama about a deaf girl, which I, I didn't think was great. It's not up to the standard of the other ones, but it does show an interesting other side of him. Mm. He's, He's got wasn't... an uncredited movie, which has a great title, by the way, before you go any further. Oh, dad, poor dad, mama's hung you in the closet and I'm feeling so sad. Is an uncredited uh, director <laughs> role. Wow. <laughs> which is perfect title. But yeah, I think he, he wasn't, he was capable of going to very dark places. And we've certainly seen that with Sweet Smell of Success, but he wasn't as jaundiced as Robert Hamer could get. But equally, he wasn't as sort of broadly comic as Charles Christ. And he was kind of, he was Ealing's all-rounder to me. He was the one who seemed to be able to look at everything the studio was doing and say, yeah, I can synthesize that. I can sum it up. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I largely agree. I mean, he, he helmed one of what I think is probably the top three British movies ever made in The Lady Killers. Complete. And through them and this, it's... A director who was chameleonic. I mean, the genres that he jumped from weren't really they weren't really certain, like similar from movie to movie. But throughout all of them, he always had this very pointed political thing he was trying to do, or this statement that he was trying to make. I can't remember it from the Lady Killers. I'll be honest, but because it's been a while since I've seen that. But he wasn't a director who was really all that interested in surface. But also, when he did surface, it was excellent. If that yeah. makes sense, he was uh, he was always operating on two levels. The surface is just the means to get to what's beneath, if that makes sense. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. And a very interesting man. The fact that he quit and became a lecturer at the University of California, I think it was. Yeah. You should read I think that. That's what, yeah, I think that's what Alex Cox does now, actually, these days. He... Uh, after his career tanked, he went and became a lecturer over at, what, the University I, of North Carolina or something like that? He, he yeah. tanked, he burned it down completely. Bad enough of this, I'm just burning everything. <laughs> completely, yeah, that's true. Do you think you would ever let me be a part of your show? Uh, just because I would love to find myself in that Sark module with you were the controls. I would, uh, that would definitely fall into the category of new race. Mm. That is where I live. And with that, we have done the final director of season one, Alexander McKendrick, done and dusted. So for the final time this season, and we've got a what have you been watching section, which I invite some new people to talk about what we've been watching. So um, I've been joined this week by Oliver. Hello there. Hi. Uh, Aiden. Hello. We're blurring the lines because he was also on the other part of the show. I know, uh, I'm, not exa- I'm not exactly new, am I? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Bell, lastly. Hello. Hello. Um, past weekend, we've had a, a pretty cool event online, uh, the Soho Horror Film Festival. So, Bell. Yeah, and um, well, first... Thanks for having me back on in such a short turnaround of time. I'm excited to talk about what I've been watching. But yes, I virtually attended the Soho, or So Home, as it's <laughs> the pun on words, but the Soho Horror Pride Festival for Pride Month. And so just a fully queer film festival that just puts queer creatives, queer filmmakers, queer stories at the forefront. And it was a really good lineup of loads of different films Um I created a letterbox list of everything I watched. So if anyone wants to follow me there, they can look at my ranking. Same name, Mick Spell Morrigan. But yeah, um, so there was a good number of shorts, which I loved. Some short films, which were really good. Uh, I'll just name the three of them that were my favorites, just because they're. I would recommend anyone try and catch them. The first one was called The Fabric of You. And it's a mm. short film that's guaranteed to have you then um, reaching for the tissues because, like, it it broke me. <laughs> I was in tears. It's, it is very impressive to get that sort of reaction in a short. I think the only time, yeah, I, I, uh, it was Cargo. Have you seen that? The little zombie short about a. Um, oh yeah. 
a dad getting his baby, even though he's been turned into a zombie. Got me hard, that one did. Yeah. That was that was remade on Netflix, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a feature with with, um, with, with uh, Martin uh, Freeman. Yeah. yeah, but Fabric of You also did that. That's impressive. Yeah, um, really, just powerful. Like a very kind of animated uh, mice, like kind of like and stop motion animation as well. So it's really I love that type of style. But essentially two mice and i won't spoil the, st- the twist because like the twist is part of the punch of the story but it's just a really beautiful story that has queer love at the center of it and the opposite direction <laughs> another short i watched which which was called unicorn absolutely hilarious a full like slapstick comedy basically unicorn the premise <laughs> is you know for those who might not know a unicorn is both a mythical creature but is also the stand-in for a couple that's looking to play with someone, both of them play with them when it comes to non-monogamy. And this okay. film is a play on that, in that they have one character who is a unicorn who is meeting a couple, and then it turns out they actually want to sacrifice them to a sex demon, and the entire... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. And like the entire like short is just like both like kind of a criticism of unicorn hunters who which is the name for couples that search for unicorns and it also has a really good message about consent and kink and everything highly mm. recommend it absolutely it's hilarious quick it really is yes. quick it sounds like it really it. does <laughs> it really does <laughs> <laughs> but highly recommend that one and the last short which was another standout of some of the many ones that i watched but it's another one called last queen on earth Again, brilliant little premise to it, but essentially this uh, man or person of nondescript gender, it's not entirely clear, but basically they wake up and it looks like it's been an apocalypse and they decide, oh, I'm the last person alive. I'm going to start dressing how I want. And it's like progresses as this person who works on a farm starts to just dress more and more femme. And that there's this brilliant uh, sequence of like... (laughs) plowing the field in high heels and using like the high heels to like press the seeds into the ground it's just brilliant but yeah it's just a little little kind of film and then at the end of it there looks like there's these type of rednecks so he's not the last person alive and he hunts them down in a full like drag get up wig makeup everything and it's really funny but also bittersweet as well but i'd recommend that too that's the last queen on earth and just from the description yeah. of it it sounds like there's like a sort of a touch of John Waters in that one. Definitely. I got strong John Waters vibes from it. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. On the radar immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you could easily see Divine just in that role. <laughs> it was definitely John Waters vibes. And... Divine is... Oh. <laughs> I, I have speechless, honestly. <laughs> and that's almost a good transition into probably my favourite of the features that I watched on over the weekend, which I've seen before. It's one of my favourite new queer horror films. And for the festival, they did like a live commentary with the directors of it on Zoom. And it was just really okay. fun. But the film is Death Drop Gorgeous. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it. I it's a um, fantastic queer film. Um, like it's a very... Like it is a low budget horror film, indie film, oh. and but it doesn't take away from it. I don't think anyway. It's got some really impressive kills. It's essentially a slasher set in the drag scene of Providence, Rhode Island area or New York. Providence is the name of the town, but I think it's New York, but it might be Rhode Island. I'm not entirely I'm clear not, on that. I'm not great on American <laughs> no. So much of it. <laughs> exactly. It's too vast. But yeah, it's just a beautiful film that like is both kind of like critiquing the drag scene of New York about how like certain type of people are considered to be acceptable drag queens while others don't get it. And it's also a commentary on like aging and stuff like that. And it's a just yeah. a really nice, beautiful story that's also a really great slasher and it's got so much comedic elements in it. So definitely recommend that film i'm it i i shouted from the rooftops <laughs> every day on twitter because it's one of my favorite queer films <laughs> uh it's slasher has had to evolve hasn't it over recent years i think mm. it's it's done some great work as a genre to keep itself interesting because uh, for a while it was how do you keep that genre going when the mobile phone exists 
Yes. Mm. And but I think they've managed that pretty well, honestly. They definitely have, and <laughs> that's actually one of the best uh, like scenes in like death scenes in the film utilizes mobile phones in that they have their version of Grinder and they're it's like in this yeah. club and it's like basically, you know, the killer is like hey, I have a glory hole. And a person goes up to the glory hole. And oh. yep, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a film that features a, a penis being removed using a meat grinder. And, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a really, it's a film filled with heart. It's a small budget indie, but you can yeah. tell that it's people who care about the movie that they've made. And I just love it. It's, I think it's a really beautiful film. Just from hearing that description, it reminds me of um, oh, what was that movie film that came out a few years back? That Knife Plus Heart. That's what I'm thinking about. Uh, Knife Plus Heart is amazing. Yeah. yeah, I would recommend that one have if you, you want. Have you not seen it? No, it's on my list. I haven't actually watched it yet. I think it's on Shudder at the moment. I might have to try I'm and catch sure. it after this. Um, if I remember correctly, it's a Jello set in the French gay porn scene. Am I mm. that correct? And he has a knife shaped like a, a phallic penis, so it's great. <laughs> immediately <Yeah. laughs> it's weird her. that one because it was a great movie but it's it's just not been released in any other format and I think it's a great shame really mm. Mm. for all of us sort of old fashioned people who like having all of our favourite movies on Blu-ray <laughs> it's just it's just a tease honestly <laughs> um, we'll come back to more uh, Soho stuff if you have it I assume you do um, going left to Aiden to me, um, yeah, I mean, normally what I tend to do for this is go through, like, my Horror Times 52 challenge on Letterboxd, uh, just because I think it's, like, some interesting stuff that I can dig through the list and get through. Uh, and this week it was uh, a sequel plus, re- well, no, it was sequel, I'll take that back, it was sequel, prequel, remake week. And okay. uh, and this could go, like, a whole manner of things. It could have been, like, you know, the Halloweens or any of the Texas Chainsaw Massacres. Oh, Phantasm it's... 4, the best of the Halloweens. <laughs> 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 I did see the first Phantasm, actually, for uh, uh, this challenge, and I quite liked it. I quite liked it a lot. Quite laid-back Americana vibe. Anyway, that's yeah. besides the point. Um, uh, the film that I decided to choose is actually a sequel to... Have you guys heard of a film called At Midnight, I'll Take Your Soul? Um, what's it called? Uh, Coffin Jaw? Coffin Jaw, that's it. Um, so I watched the sequel to that, This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse. In, uh, firstly, I'm not going to watch, a f- I am definitely going to watch a film with that title alone. <laughs> <laughs> As a title, I just think it's amazing. There's been about four Coffin Jaw movies, hasn't there? And he's, he's a pervy old guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <Coffin Jaw. laughs> there's, been, there's, been a, there's been a few, there's been more than you think, because um, I think originally there's a trilogy, uh, A Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse, and one from the late noughties that I can't remember the title escapes me from. But there's like the whole like universe of Coffin Jaw movies. And the guy who made it is a person called Jose Mejica Marins, who... Um, well, as Rob's saying, that Coffin Jaw is like this very perverse evil character i mean like beyond deplorable so and really what the films entail each of the films entail is like um his various sh- shall we call them escapades to find like the perfect woman so they can give birth to uh, like the, his son who will be like the perfect lineage to him it's along those lines and it's like incredibly just dark spooky sort of environment that Marin's created. It's obviously made on, like, this is, like, Brazil in, like, the 1960s, and it's just, like, even yeah. for, like, something that's so limited with the budgeting that he had to do with that, you can really tell that Marin's is, like, really going far with it. I mean, he's just imploring yeah. everything that he can. I mean, I think in the first one, he actually has, like, a fourth, plenty of fourth wall breaks, with um, which is telling him not to watch the movie. It's great. I, I think he's at the be-all and end-all of Brazilian horror, because there's not a lot of it. <laughs> Mm. And it's interesting because, uh, I mean, This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse, I mean, I'll be honest, I think it's, uh, as much as I liked it, Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, I think it does show its limitations when you, you know, properly watch it through. And, I, you know, that can't be helped. But This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse, I just loved, man. It, there's just this, <laughs> it's grander, it's like much more on a theatrical level. I think Marin's is just having a whale of a time. And I, I don't think I get the sense he wants to, you know, he wants to offend everyone, but he's having fun with it at the same time. I think you can from, tell. From reputation, I've heard that this one, well, the series as a whole is kind of necrophiliac I don't know what the right term is, but I think I've got, a, got it across. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, 
really good. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in there that would strike me as that, if you get what I mean. Uh, I mean, because there is like a, a series, of kind of, I think it is actually called Necrophilia, the series. Is it called that? It's like, it's necromantic. Oh, yeah, it's it necromantic. Yeah. Necromantic, that's it. Yeah. I would, yeah. I, I'm afraid to admit that I actually have a necromantic tattoo of the artwork. That's good. And, artwork. Well, and, you know. And the LP on like the soundtrack vinyl, which I stumbled across that. I don't know. For some reason, when I was like twenty, I thought films about necrophilia were the coolest things in the world. But it's it's a small niche to <laughs> freaking interest in, I guess. Mm. <laughs> wow, well, you know, it's, yeah. yeah. But no, I, yeah, I, I never really got that from um, the Coffin Jewel films. They're more they're more like the more boogeyman slashes if you want to look him that way. But at the same time, you know, there's like scenes where Marins is like torturing people with snakes and like poking people's eyes out with incredibly long fingernails. They're just uh, eye violence. Yeah. That's my button. I can't do eye violence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even for sixties, you know, it, it is incredibly like, you know, cr incredibly like balls to the wall in your face. Yeah, I'm gonna like do something that's incredible. I think they predate Night of the Living Dead. Actually, the more I think about it, uh, Night um, of the Living Dead is sixty eight. Uh, I think. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it will do. This night, I'll possess your corpse. Sixty seven. Yeah, yeah, it, it will do. Um. But there's a fantastic sequence where just the whole film, just uh, where Coffin Joe actually descends into hell, and it's shot in lurid colour. And I think it might be one of my favourite depictions of hell ever on celluloid. Just these bright lurid coloured body limbs like popping out of the wall, the cave walls, oh, manic screaming. Thank it's terrific. You for that, by the way, you've just given just to break the fourth wall of this podcast. I was going to do a, I'm doing a series of videos um, called This the Mania called Needlessly Nerdy Lists about very, very specific things. And the first one I'm going to do is about the top five films of season one. And you just give me the idea for episode two Best Depictions of Hell. That's a cool one. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that, Aiden. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Um, but no, I, I would recommend the first two Coffin Jaw films because they're, they're definitely like old school, spooky, fun time. I would say I I definitely wouldn't. It, it, they never struck me as like as we were saying before, like on the necromantic kind of vibe. They they're just there to have like a massive, you know, fun time. Really, um, so when your balls out, that's what you yeah. want to do. But, you know. Yeah, strikes me that they the never they never made the release over to home media yet in this country, which is a, it's a bit of a shame. But oh well, well it's, it's, it's always with things like that. It's always a licensing um, issue of some really odd person will have them in his basement and he won't realise it. Like the, the Master Prince. And it's just finding that weird person who's got them in his basement, <laughs> honestly. Um, so, uh, Oliver, on to you. What have you been watching? Hi, yeah, well, lots of stuff, but um, I, I guess the first thing I'll talk about is I saw <laughs> the new Elvis film, uh, or the new Baz Luhrmann film, I should say, which... Um, yeah, I wasn't um I wasn't too bothered about seeing it. Um but me and my girlfriend you know, we have uh, the Cine World uh, whatever is unlimited membership, so we figured yeah. we'd just go mm. see it. Um because why not? And she's she's a fan of Elvis. Um It's been I, described as the speed racer of Elvis, Elvis biopics. Uh, I think is an amazing quote for anything. Uh yeah, I guess I could I can see that. Um it's well, I, I actually don't you know, I don't have anything I don't I wouldn't stop dissing someone who liked Elvis, but I don't really listen to him or know anything about him. But um, mm. or Baz Luhrmann, really. I watched Romeo and Juliet a lot as a. Yeah. I watched Romeo and Juliet when I was in like you know school, like everyone probably did, and mm. I've seen The Great Gatsby like maybe like when I was fifteen or sixteen. But yeah, I thought it was really good actually. I was uh, really surprised by um, how much I enjoyed it. Really, um, Tom Hanks. I've never seen Tom Hanks play a role like that before in my life. Um, I think it's maybe. I, the, I don't know if it's the first time he's played a villain. Maybe. Um, well, I mean, I'll be honest. I think the best Tom Hanks is '80s Tom Hanks. So yeah, the Burbs is his mm, best. Film. Yeah, the Burbs is clearly his best film. Yeah, I mean, come on. Yes. Yeah, I mean that is true. But this, he, it's almost like he's playing Max Shrek from Nosferatu, like Interview of a Vampire. Like he has all this really? like, prosthetic makeup on, and like he's doing this Hungarian accent. I think it's Hungarian. Oh, I mean, there was that um, movie he did. Um, he's not great at accents. It's better than the one where he played the character who was living out of an airport uh, terminal. Oh, terminal well, I haven't there, seen you know. that one. I haven't seen that. But, um, it's not a great accent. It's kind of like, you know, if anyone's at House of Gucci, it's a bit like um, the accents in that. Like, 
what uh, Lady Gaga's <laughs> Italian, which is actually probably closer to Russian. Yeah, it, it's not great, but it's it's at least kind of like you know, it's just funny because it's Tom Hanks. I think is the hmm. Jar- also, Jar- yeah Jared Leto playing Wario. Every yeah. time I think about that film, it just makes me howl of laughter. <laughs> it is actually quite similar to to Jared Leto, but it it fits more in the film because he's kind of playing this evil like the way that it's shot like when he first when you first the first like proper scene with both uh austin butler who's really good as elvis and tom hanks as his manager uh elvis is about to go on stage and play some some show pretty small show and tom hanks has heard that this this elvis guy is um you know he hears his song on this record and he's like, oh, no one's ever gonna release his album, his music, or whatever, because you know he's 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 a African American, like you know they don't have you know because obviously it's in the set in the fifties. Um, and this kid's like, no, he's a white guy. And then you just see like Tom Hanks's face, like character's face, just like fill with like stun, and he and he just kind of you don't literally see them, but you could just tell he's like can see like money in this because he's just mm. like this like horrible <laughs> businessman. And he goes to this show where uh, Elvis is playing and. The way that Baz Luhrmann like frames him, he looks like literally like Nosferatu or some like German expressionist like monster, like just like just like lurking like through these like shadows of like this stage. It's very it's very good actually. Um, and the you know it, it goes heavy on like montages. You know, there's like scenes where there's like literally like seven or ten, seven, ten, maybe even like twelve different images like playing all at the same time with like different angles, and you know it will then pull out and it'll do like a swoop across the screen and it'll, you're, you're in somewhere else now and then five minutes later you're somewhere else and it it doesn't really stop it's kind of like two and a half hours of like constant adrenaline and there's a few like slow moments you know sad melody High camp as well it sounds as yeah well. and again it's Baz and that's that's yeah, it. that's a, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's actually not i mean i don't I haven't i can't remember i haven't seen Baz film in a long time but it wasn't as camp as I thought people were making it out to be. I don't know if it's just because Basil Luhrmann has that sort of, um, I, I don't know, reputation that people are kind of like instantly giving it this like big camp label. But mm. I mean, there's there's some moments for sure. But um, I think a lot of it was more like theatrical, like operatic. You know, it kind of felt like I was watching a, an actual opera, like the way that the characters move and, the you know, it, it felt like a sort of a musical mix of like, uh, classical theatre, um, but then made by someone who's on like lots of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like drugs. a Baz Luhrmann film. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the editing, you know, yeah, yeah, the editing must have you know taken a long time because it's it's very you know well, it's, I I like it because I'm really into like you know like it really reminded me of really old like you know like the so- old soviet films like eisenstein where it's like mon- uses like montages it doesn't have much like actual spoken dialogue like it, it does this thing where there's a we'll talking about that in a minute but there's a great scene at the start of the film where he's elvis is playing to all these like young people like boys and girls like teenagers maybe like you know young adults and he starts doing the the, the whole pelvis shake thing and if you've seen the trailer you've seen it and they all start like, mm. basically orgasming in like and you can just see their faces like just like like going insane and they're all like screaming and then, like, another scene, uh, you know, like, 40 minutes into the film, he's doing this charity show, which is at this, like, pivotal moment where, like, the, all the conservative sen- senators are like, you need to stop doing this because you're, like, you know, you're you're just a menace. You know, like, he gets really blasted by the press and stuff. And he starts doing the, you know, the, the classic Elvis, like, pelvis shaking and the moves. And instead of zooming in on the young people, it, like, zooms in on, like, the, the senators. And their faces are just, like, completely, like, frozen in, like, horror of like what they're seeing it's just a really like interesting um you know parallels and he uses a lot of like the same kind of shots and yeah i thought it was a really well made film actually and austin Butler's really good and it, mm. yeah i don't mm. care for elvis really at all but i thought it was a at, at the very least an entertaining film but i thought it mm. was yeah it's great well that's the least you're gonna get from Baz Luhrmann. he'll always be entertaining um, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I, n- I never really got on with him after seeing romeo and juliet and Romeo and Juliet is a film, again, like, as you were saying before, Oliver, uh, it was a film that I saw countless times during my GCSE English lessons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. T- too many times. Yeah, it's <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's not a film I'm fond of, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to segue out of that, so I'll just warn. Uh, so I, I've been watching um, a debut film from a sci-fi horror thing. And from Rob Schroeder, who produced their two films from uh, Shudder, uh, Sunchoke and Holidays. 
I've not seen either of them, but this one is called Ultrasound, and it's his directorial debut. And I'm going to struggle to talk about this. <laughs> it does for does for hypnotism what the brood does for therapy. Um, but essentially, this is a very very complicated movie, which is dealing a lot with what's happening in the mind and what's happening in reality. Because at the beginning, it starts with a guy who's out in the middle of nowhere. His car breaks down, uh, full of rain, and he turns up this house with an older man and a very young daughter. Not very young wife, I should say. And uh, it escalates that evening to basically the young man sleeping with the wife. Um, fast forward a little bit, and she's pregnant. Okay. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, because essentially none of that actually happened. What it actually is, is some sort of um, very advanced level of therapy as um, thera- no, uh, hypnotism as therapy, where it has you constantly questioning what is real, what isn't real. It's, it's pulling you in all sorts of different directions. You don't know what is happening. Or, and it, it does it many times throughout it where it'll present a scene and it'll show how much of that was actually happening and how much of it is completely fabricated. So it, it creates this very uh, dream logic sort of um, sensibility to it. Um, mm. And it keeps you guessing throughout all of it. But I think when it comes to movies like this, when it comes to movies that play around with sort of linearity and play around with who you, you're supposed to sympathise with and where mm. they are in sort of the grand scheme of the story, it all pins and uh, focuses around the fact that do you care about any of the characters and what happens to them? And the problem here is it doesn't particularly have like a lead character that you can sort of sympathise with. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, it's got the pregnant woman who's all, who's not pregnant, who she disappears for vast amounts of time. And um, the man who was caught in the rain, who was also using this therapy to learn how to walk, but he can also walk. Mm-hmm. Um, and the woman who works at this building who's instigating this uh, revolutionary technique. And it's all designed around, as the title suggests, different frequencies of sound. So it's it's an interesting idea. It has like a vibe. I don't know if anybody's seen it similar to uh, Come True from a few years ago. True. Um, but at the end of the day, if you don't relate to the characters, it's just an awful lot of confusing narrative and not a lot of anything, really. Yeah, that mm. sounds like a pain. I think it's like, if you don't have that hook for at least, you know, like you said, a character that you can kind of get behind, then... Yeah. When it's confusing, it just makes it like worse. Like as a like a slight you know, tangent, it sounds like similar in vibes to one of the other ones I actually watched just this weekend at Soho called Cold Wind Blowing. Really mm-hmm. br- brilliant film that just came out from Cybercraft Films, uh, directed by Dion Copeland, produced and edited by Louise Weird, and again queer characters at the forefront queer creators making it but essentially it's kind of like what you were describing it sounded very similar as in it's like remote like cabin like very remote setting um and it's also there's lots of like you're not really sure if what these characters are experiencing is actually happening or not like there's this creature in the woods is there a creature or not you don't know but the characters you do you care for them? Like they're really fleshed out people. You can relate to them, like their struggles. It's so I think important that, yeah. exactly. So I would, another film I'd recommend, but it's just, it was an, an interesting contrast to the one you were describing. Like <laughs> this one also confusing in parts, but because you actually give a fuck about the characters, you kind of stick with it. <laughs> oh, of course. Mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, another big one, which is played, we played that festival. I've wanted to say, but I've never I've got the chance to yet was, uh, we're all going to the world's fair. Yes. I, that was the last film of the festival I watched. Um, I still don't know what to make of it. I think like I went into it having heard so much about it that I kind of think yeah. I built up into my head what it was going to be about. And it didn't really, it wasn't what I had in my head. What I watched, I still enjoyed for what it was. But because it didn't match up with what I was kind of expecting my experience yeah. of it is a bit, I don't know, but I know what you mean, yeah. interestingly and well made and really great um, first feature role for the main main actress. But She's very uh, young. Yeah. yeah, teenager, like really. And it like, feels like a real believable teenager. It doesn't feel like, you know, it's like a man in his 40s who's written a teenager. It feels like oh, a that's, teenager. That's, that's one of my problems that, I mean, it really annoys me. Why is this teenager talking like a script writer? <laughs> 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 it's 
so happened so much. Is any of it sort of a highlights? Like the pluck out? Any other any other highlights from the festival? From Soho, yeah. Soho. Yeah, um yeah, like the other um two that I um, I wrote down that stood out for me, um both very different and like equally um good. One is called Super Hot kind of very much that one yeah. yeah it's not like new this year i think it was just um chosen for the festival like if i remember it came out maybe last year or even 2020 possibly but basically like the premise is there's this young girl she's like a pizza delivery driver and her next door neighbor who she's crushing on hard is moving into a sorority house and then she turns it it turns out the sorority house is filled with vampires and it's about her <laughs> trying to rescue her friend, her, her crush and oh uh, it's just the characters are all like hardcore nerds like they they're making like movie references throughout and like they're fan casting marvel films and stuff like that so they feel like believable young nerds and it's always a problem that um, yeah i know it's a very it's a very very fine line it, it, does it work or you go on too hard on it i know what you mean like it worked for me but then like i've <laughs> I've got very <laughs> wide taste when it comes to films. <laughs> oh, no, it's, 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 it, I can't remember what it was called. There was a movie like a few years before the pandemic. It was about like how a, a horror festival became real because the director of it thought that there's not enough danger in horror, so I'm going to put all these monsters out there and kill everybody. I can't remember what it was called. But that sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know I would watch that as well. <laughs> I, I want to say Bloodfest. But I don't know if that sound that doesn't feel right. Something like that. Hmm. But one of the characters is it, it's just he goes past that line of the nerdy references are a bit more chair. So. I know what you mean. As in, it's like it's almost like trying to capture that Randy magic from Scream. Like you kind of want to have that oh. character who knows this, but you can't really beat Randy because Randy is Randy. <laughs> like you know, oh, every yeah. everything's going to compare to Randy. <laughs> I wouldn't say he's the original, but he kind of feels it. Yeah, um, for a certain generation, he's probably feels like the original in a way. Um, And the last other film that I would also had a great time with, which I would recommend, was called Roadhead. (laughs) Um, I think that one I've heard of as well, yeah. It's like full, like, exploitation schlock. Fantastic. (laughs) It's a film which has both accidental dick biting, intentional (laughs) dick biting, lots of beheadings... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a hilarious drag queen. Um, oh, it's just fantastic. The main actress, or Stephanie, that is pl- her. The, ac- the actress is playing the character Stephanie. The actress is Elizabeth Gruion. And for people who might have played the video game uh, Jedi Fallen Order, this actress does is the character of the sis- the ninth sister in that game, the one that hunts okay. Cal. Um, so it was cool to see her in an actual live action role but oh the film is just brilliant and it's just got so many quotable lines it has this character who's the executioner who's just like a big giant himbo and is just like <laughs> dumb as a bag of rocks and is oh i adored this film so i would highly recommend it if you know a good film like with mates and maybe some weed but it's an exploitation <laughs> schlock fantastic Roadhead. Yeah. Fit in them, given what you said about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great platform as well, because uh, that whole side of um, horror, well, cinema, the queer side of cinema, is represented really, really well by horror. Mm-hmm. Maybe not by other sort of broader sense of cinema, but in horror, there's a platform like this for those sort of filmmakers, trans, bi, gay, lesbian, and, and everybody. It's fantastic, I think. 100% and you know if, like for, from my perspective the more specifically queer horror festivals the better like I don't know because I think for like you know just putting minority like it's a more diverse crowd you know like you yeah. know, we, we, we've had you know 60 years of horror films made by straight white men <laughs> it would be nice to kind of have some difference <laughs> it would yeah and there's lots of um, uh, black filmmakers as well coming up for yes. horror as well which I think is just a great weirdly it's the most progressive side of cinema, I think. I dare say. Definitely, I would. I, I've always kind of felt like that. It's 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 the genre, like the audience, the fans of horror tend to a lot of the time be in some ways, you know, social outsiders. They represent a lot of you know social minorities and marginalized groups. So those 
peat voices are the ones that are it feels like are steering horror at the moment and it's great to see like more more different oh, yeah. stories is better for everyone indeed well said um Aiden. I mean, I would continue talking about horror as well, but I, I mean, I've got to get through this uh, Ponzi art film that I also saw over the <laughs> last week. Um, uh, but no, I mean, I, I'm probably doing it for a massive disservice because I've saw a conversation piece, uh, Lucini, Lucino Visconti film. Uh, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with this filmmaker, but um, he's the guy who did, I think, Rocco and his brothers, uh, The Leopard. Uh, yeah, and, I remember him. Yeah. And I'm uh, afraid to say, you know, it, it wasn't my cup of tea at all. Um, so here we have, like, Burt Lancaster is, like, this reti- retired American professor who's, like, renovating his flat. Uh, his pal- like, his home in uh, Rome to, uh, like, these inmates, who, well, not inmates, but, you know, people who are coming in to renovate, I think, the kitchen area or something like that. And judging from that premise alone, it's, like, not the most exhilarating premise in the world. But I think the problem with that I've always had with Visconti is that I, I just find him like kind of a born dry kind of filmmaker, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's cinematic roughage, isn't it? I mean, he, technically and skill wise, he's very, very good. Mm. But he can be very, very good and not boring. It's just mm. it's a choice that he couldn't discern between. He has to be both. Mm, yeah, and th- you know there are Visconti's films that I have appreciated in the past. I mean, I, I'm a massive advocate of Rocco and his brothers. Uh, which is a neorealist film from the you know, if, you know what you know what Fate will do now. I said that about him. I'm watching him come out in one of the next picks. Watch, <laughs> watch it happen. <laughs> I don't even know if he's on the list. To be honest, um, Just to punish like, me. <laughs> 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 but no, this um, apart from really Burt Lancaster's performances, which I, I mean, Burt Lancaster, I mean, is just well, we were talking about it on the Kendrick episode in general because he is just a great actor. And when I think he's good, this, it's amazing, yeah, yeah. And at this, you know, you can tell he's trying his best. He's very mournful, very like um, you know, nostalgic of the past, I guess. Um, but like I say, the problem is is not just with him and not just how, like, it, it runs for like two hours as well and it, it's like such a drag on its feet when it yeah. just doesn't really need to be that long at all. Plus on the top of that, you've also got like um, the side cast who are immensely annoying in this. <laughs> they either want to talk about getting fucked or like getting like swearing at the top of the heads, using crude language and it's just like, shut up, please shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh bless him bless him yeah, like, oh stop stop this is not fun yeah yeah it's like i'm uh, being invited to like a house party and like they're not even halfway drunk they're just like t- just about tipsy and they're just stood there for like the next two hours waffling on about shite it's yeah uh, there's a, here's a question though for you Ian. have you, have you stopped watching a movie because you find it just so annoying the characters i have once it was an australian horror movie called razorback and it was just oh, too much right, of yeah. I had to stop. They were annoying yeah. the hell out of me. <laughs> I was not a fan of Razorback either. I have seen that film and it's just like, yeah, it's it's a bit full on, that one. Um, with his oddisms. I yeah. think mine was the Love Witch, actually, the more I think about it. Yeah, you know that would say that I've got in arguments online about not liking the Love Witch, but yeah. yeah. Horses, horses. <laughs> uh, I would say I, I haven't seen any of his Connie films um yet, mm. but I have read The Leopard, which is the book that the film is based on. Mm. And it's very good. It's one of my favourite books of all time. It's a tremendous novel. Yeah, because um, that's always you know brought up as Visconti's masterpiece, and I haven't seen it yet because you know I, I mean I'm not a fan of period pieces at all, uh, and it's partly why it's holding me back in the minute. Um, he's done a lot. Of his a lot of his films are period pieces. Yeah. Oh so. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, but if there if there is a good one out of his filmography, I think definitely start out with Rocco and his brothers. Um, I thought I thought that was a very very good one actually. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Oliver, right? Okay. Well, I, I actually went to go see *Crimes of the Future* in the cinema. Um, how? Where? <laughs> how, how <are> <laughs> uh, I was in Paris. Um, uh, uh, me and my me and my girlfriend are meant to go on in March. Um, we had to postpone it. And about four days before we we left, I was like, "Oh well, crap! *Crimes of the Future* might still be on in." In French cinema. I bet she loved that. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, we we watched Crash together, and she she oh. thought it was oh. okay. So she wasn't it wasn't her first Cronin book, but um, oh well, that's okay. Um, mm. But yeah, she liked it, and and I I loved it. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. It was um, this French um, sort of uh, chain cinema. Um, I mean, it still has like um, you know, it's not like the UK where um, 
you know, a film runs for about a week and then it's, it's out. Um, I think and then they've got like, they put seven screens over to a Marvel movie or something. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They, I think they had, um, there was a lot of cinema still playing it and I think it had been out for about three or four weeks at, when we wow. went to see it. So it, you know, it's still running pretty strong. Um, um, and yeah, it, it was great. Um, it's, um, and I, I, I'm a big Cronenberg fan. I uh, don't, think he's done a bad film which is maybe a hot take i think pretty much everything he's done is good even oh, yeah. even the ones that people seem to hate i love cosmopolis <laughs> i love m butterfly Master stars all the the odd things he's done as well yeah. as you know i actually prefer his his um non-body horror work to his, his body horror films which is he, he's a hot take i don't like video drama that's got me in trouble as well <laughs> yeah I, I mean yeah I would, I would i would happily argue that for Twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, when we do the Cronenberg episode, they're all going to say, "Let's do video drama." Now. Oh, no. I'm playing myself, and it'd be awkward. <laughs> yeah, for me, Crash and Dead Ringers are his. Specific. Dead Ringers. Is Dead a Ringers. Is, yeah, Dead Ringers is my favorite too. I love Dead Ringers. Um, yeah, but this this is a sort of it's a mix of existence. It's, it's that's probably the, if anyone's I'm, I'm guessing someone has seen Existence because it's a pretty big film, um, pretty big one of his. I think it was one of his more successful films, but. It, it's very yeah. similar to that, you know, has this very strange concept, which, you know, most people probably know is, you know, sort of um, Viggo Mortensen's character can can grow organs. Um, and he's not the only person. There's there's a more, more and more people have started being able to, like, grow random organs. And he and um, Leah Seydoux's character um, perform body art where they remove them in front of a crowd. Um, and then... Over the course of film, this this government body who want to basically keep track of all these new organs that people are growing and sort of categorize them and stuff, um, they sort of start. You know, he starts going to them and telling them about the stuff he's been growing. And there's all these other shady characters, and you know, uh, I think they, I think they literally call them like radical groups that like um, can eat plastic um, and stuff. Um, and it's you know, it's it's Cronenberg. You know, he's like what seventy. Five, maybe 79 i think a very old person um and yeah for for a man of his age it's a very um it's a very good film uh not that i mean anything but you know it's it's a film that feels like it's trying to say four or five things at once uh, and that you would usually be bad you know usually if your film has like you know it feels like it's trying to say multiple things at once it can become a bit messy and you're a bit like god what's this film about but it really does feel like Cronenberg is like kind of, you know, he's at the stage where he's older and he doesn't have all much time left maybe. And he doesn't, he can't get the budgets he used to be able to get. So he's like, right, I'm going to pack as much as I possibly can into this like one hour for every runtime. And it works, you know, and there's a lot of themes, you know, like climate change, sort of like bodily control with regards to sort of like, you know, um, transgender people, you know, women and like obviously abortion rights and things like all these kind of timely issues. Also a lot of the, the Viggo Mortensen's character is like this artist who like every time he wants to make art, he has to like literally like pull an organ out of his body and like show people it, which felt very kind of like metaphorical of like Cronenberg's own career. Like, you know, every time he wants to make a film, he has to like take a part of his body out and like, well, that's, that's show the artist process, isn't it? Like every yeah. time you make a movie, like you're bearing a piece of your soul and he's just yeah. making it very, very literal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it has a lot of, you know, those kind of three main things. And there's loads of other, you know, themes and, and metaphors it plays with. And it, you know, it's, it's fantastic the way it does it. And it, it also does this really interesting thing where there's like no establishing shots really, it's very claustrophobic. You don't really know where it is it's set or when it's set. There's no like context really given, you know, and it's very minimal. Like the set's very bare and there's not, you know, it looks great, but it's not yeah. very like theatrical or lavish or, you know, like it's not like Dead Ringers, for example, which is very colorful and bright and sort of has all these like metal objects and stuff. It's very quite basic, but yeah, um, it's really good. Anyone who, if you like, if you like Cronenberg, you're probably gonna like it. That's it's sort of yeah. yeah. It's a very, yeah. it's very much like that. And um, and also, you know, I think he wrote it twenty years ago or so. But the the things it covers in the film, uh, you know, to me, I, I don't know if he rewrote any of it, but it it feels like the things he's writing about, you know, haven't they still feel relevant? And all the things he's talking about are still sort of you know That's time true. issues. I'd say that generally of uh, Cronenberg stuff, it's it's very evergreen. Mm-hmm. I don't know if something mm-hmm. particularly aged. No, no, it's true, you know. And I think a lot of that is down to the things he writes about are sort of 
you know, body, body, you know, lots of his films are about bodies and technology and all these things that sort of, you know, not going away anytime soon. So, yeah. yeah. And I've always stand by saying, like, The Fly is the most beautiful horror movie ever made. So, mm. mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah. One it's not favorites. quite as sad as The Fly, but um, <laughs> oh, no. I think that's one of the saddest yeah. films I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty sad, actually, the more we think about it. Yeah. Very gross as well, but, you know, it's, mm. it's chronic, but he has to do that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, this 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 film's also you know quite sad. And the the last shot is great. I'm going to say this, but it's uh, sort of and it ends in this sort of very very great way. And um, yeah, it's just really good. I really hope it comes to the UK soon so I can see it again. And so yeah, the sad fact yeah. is it's got a release on American VOD before it's got a Even, date yeah. in UK. And Ireland. Yeah, I mean, it's, exactly. It's it's I a mean, massive uh, kick in the balls, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's really. A film to see. Everyone says, you know, every film anyone ever talks about, they say it's a film to see at the cinema. Um, Except ever... Horst. <laughs> but it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the only, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I don't want to ruin it by ending on something which is really trivial. So well, let's end on Cronenberg. That's a good way to end season one. Um, so, yes, season one, done and dusted. There's going to be a little break uh, about a month in that month i'm going to release a video as i mentioned earlier of uh, top five films from a personal stance because if it's from an academic stance it's literally going to be the same five films as anybody could pick mm-hmm. um but yeah we're back uh, the first friday of august with a new season um yeah that's about it, that's about it. so um oliver where can we find you on the internet yeah uh I'm on twitter uh, at Oliver T. Parker, and uh, I'm also on Letterboxd at Oliver X. Parker. Um, and my Letterbox is, is also in my Twitter bio, if anyone forgets. What, um, yep. Okay. Uh, in. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Doco and Drummer. Uh, you can also find me on Letterboxd under the username Aiden F. Uh, you can find me on Instagram if you want. I, I, I go by the same my same twitter handle as i as i am there but to be honest i only really use that for like family stuff for personal reasons um but yeah that's where you can find me and uh bell yeah and thank you yeah, so i'm mix bell morrigan that's m-x-b-e-l morrigan across all social media my website is fishnetsandphilosophy.wordpress.com and one last note just as we were finishing on cronenberg for Soho Horror Festival, they had like a cabaret to kick the festival off on Friday, and I yeah. did a The Fly inspired burlesque act, which you can catch on my YouTube channel. <laughs> I've seen some of the costumes that people did. Um, Igraine, who's been in this podcast a few times, she did mm. a cosplay of Martyrs, which, yeah. wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The entire, Google, the entire Google's magazine act was really cool. Oh. I'll have to check that out because if it's anything of the way that's standard, it's some pretty high level stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I think that's a great point to end the uh, season one on. So uh, yes, are you being your host, Rob? And thank you for listening. We'll be back in a month. <laughs>